The future isn't female. The future is inclusive. That is what this session is about. I am so, so proud to be joined by Christine Rodriguez, who is the ambassador and board member at Girls in Tech. Christine has been involved in the digital and e-commerce industry for the past decade, predominantly focusing on driving best-in-class digital experience and the adoption technology through her time at Adobe, PayPal, and Braintree. Christine also sits on the Australian Board for Girls in Tech, which is a not-for-profit chartered to educate, enable, and empower women through the likes of events and workshops, networking, and, of course, community engagement. As an ambassador for diversity, equality, and inclusion, Christine is dedicated to helping organizations and individuals instate positive measures, mindsets, and changes for the future. So right now, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Christine. It's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. Um, I'm dialing in from Sydney, Australia. So before I begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, Girls in Tech acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend all, our, um, all that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. To start off, I'd like to say amazing event so far. Mary has to have been my favourite. Uh, and a big thank you to the team at Wishlist for having me a part of this inaugural event here in APAC today. As Raven mentioned, my name is Christine Rodriguez. I'm a board member, but I'm also the newly appointed co-managing director of Girls in Tech Australia. Like our friends at List, Wishlist, Girls in Tech Australia is a not-for-profit. We are a community and we are part of a global organisation. We were founded in 2007 by Adriana Gascoigne in the United States and have been operating in region since 2016. We are sitting above 50 city chapters worldwide and over 66,000 registered community members. Our Australian chapter, which I'm a part of, uh, is over 11,000 strong if you include all of our channels. And as an organisation, we have a passion for building an inclusive and diverse tech workforce. As Adriana herself puts it, we want to make tech an inclusive space where women can thrive. Throughout each year, in conjunction with our corporate and community partners and sponsors, we host a number of events, workshops, and we have a hackathon coming up and other educational and networking opportunities. If you want to learn more about Girls in Tech, Girls in Tech Australia or globally, head to our socials um, or, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Today, I'm going to chat to you about diversity, equality and inclusion. But for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to stick really closely to my lane and talk about gender diversity. I don't claim to be an authority on people and culture, on history, on recruitment, on leadership and some of the themes that I'm going to touch on today. But what I can say is that when it comes to women in tech, I'm observant, I listen, um, I'm heavily involved and vested in the conversation. If you know me, I'm quite vocal. I like to challenge and ask questions of the narrative. I'm empathetic and I'm passionate. But most of all, I'm representative of someone who identifies as a woman in tech. Today, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the why why DEIMB, why your organisation, it makes both ethical and commercial sense. If you're not already aware, bought into the concept, the statistics, the benefits, there's plenty of information to support DNI, why it's good for ideation, productivity, decision making, uh, for product design, for culture, and for your customers. If you don't believe it, I advise you simply just go outside, jump on the internet. There's an abundance of studies. It's proven. It's a fact. So you're already here. You've made the effort to seek out this particular session, either live or on demand. So generally speaking, you're either one of my adorning fans, no, thank you, or more likely you fall into one of three categories. You're looking to make a greater impact within your organisation, your team or as a manager of te a team. You are reflecting on yourself, like your actions, you know, checking your behaviour, the way you think, the way you act in the workplace and, and outside. Or you're looking to better influence more broadly your customers, their decisions, how they build, what you design and potentially your industry category as a whole. And for that, I commend you because it starts with individuals like you who take an interest in the topic um, or topical content that gets these initiatives rolling. 
I want to share with you all what I've been seeing, what I've been hearing, and hopefully this helps you address one of those potential reasons for being here. And if there are other reasons that I have missed, you know, pop them into the chat. I'd love to hear them and we'll have a look at them a little bit later. Um, but now why I've titled my session, The Future Isn't Female, The Future Is Inclusive. This is because gender equality is not about doing a 180 flip on the last few decades and marginalising men in tech. It's about the collaborative and cohesive approach to the rise of women in more roles, in technical roles, in leadership positions, within what is considered the tech industry to create more of a balance. To demonstrate some of my thinking, I sat back and I wanted to unpack for you the most frequently asked question, statement, theme that I hear in my capacity um, within Girls in Tech. I'm going to be a little bit controversial. I'm going to say off the bat, I don't love hearing it, um, but I'm going to explain why. So what is it? People often come to our events, they email me, they ring me, they LinkedIn me, they slide into my DMs. And the overarching theme is I want to hire more women or I have an open head count and I want to fill it with a female. Can you help me? Can you share my job ad? So I take a breath. If you're one of these people that's here for self-reflection or that's made this statement or that's heard this statement, I'm just going to give you a sec to think about that. As I hear it, we're aiming essentially for equality. I do not disagree with the non-malicious sentiment behind the idea. Organizations, teams, they've sat back, they've counted the numbers, and in a lot of cases, their workforce is skewing towards male dominance. So the immediate thought is, well, we have too many men and they're already here, so let's add some females in the mix and voila, we've got ourselves a nice balanced fruit punch. That will address it, but alas, this can be a troublesome approach. I want to use this time to dive into this perspective, how it shows up internally for your organisation, some ways to address the concept externally, and what impact it actually has on those individuals that you hire. Firstly, acknowledgement of the state of play, you know, that's key and that's great. Setting aspirational goals for gender balance, also great. On board with that. Mandating that the next person that takes a particular role is female is a really tough one for me. So let's start off with the internal perspective. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited to speak and present to a team, um, 88 people all up, I believe about 85% male, um, quite technical, a solutions team, all with a strong tenure, um, strong track records, great collaboration, experienced, very culturally dispersed across APAC. No one in that room didn't deserve to be there because they're a man. If they didn't deserve to be there for their performance, you know, that's a different story. But making a blanket statement to them or even alluding about a mandate about compulsory female hiring, although it sounds positive, could be a little bit detrimental. This team, who was simply hired by the same leaders who are now making these statements, didn't actually do anything wrong. So we don't want to make them feel like they themselves are a problem or unwanted. We want to flip the narrative from we've got this many people, we've got this many men, oh dear, to this is where we are. This is a point in time and we have a platform to make changes. Let's open up opportunities for those we may have overlooked in the past. We need to acknowledge, learn, set aside our conscious and unconscious biases and make this a time for action in the realm of equality and gender balance. What we could do is educate, take everybody down the path as to why this is a commercially sound idea, build diversity into the fabric of our success, look at all candidates and the weighting of things like gender or differences in background as critical elements in the hiring process, instead of saying it's because she's a woman. Does the person we're trying to hire bring a unique perspective, a difference in their uh, methods of delivery, a persona that's similar to our end customers perhaps, 
as well as the minimum skills required. Often it's the listed skills and competencies on a job description that are valued and ticked off because we've not adequately weighted the softer ones. I'm imagining you're all nodding right now and agreeing with me, um, but that's my first point. Internally, we need to eliminate the negative language that this is a problem and highlight the value of what diversity brings to the table. Next, oh, your new hire needs to be a female. By demonstrating the proven value and having diverse teams, quickness in decision-making, increased revenue, like it's all there, this will actually help mitigate the risk of perpetuating resentment and essentially discomfort for the females that enter the team or for those that get that one promotion. The last thing we want to do is groom our next generation of leaders to resent the diversity and equality movement after we've come so far. Now, I'll give you an example. I was part of a dinner conversation the other day, you know, let's call it what it was, it was a mansplaining. White, educated, 30-ish male, heads up a team of analysts for a financial institution, dictated by his senior management that he needs to hire a female. No questions asked, that needs to be the outcome without really explaining to him why and getting him bought into the concept. So he was quite, quite passionate about this. He only had two females apply for the role and unfortunately they do it near as qualified as some of the other applicants. So he's left in a situation in his own mind. Do I hire the right person for the job or do I hire the woman? So if I don't hire the woman, then I'm also in trouble and then his ethics are being questioned. It's a very perplexing um, compact, com, um, concept. Now, obviously, I have to defend the position of the managers, like where it comes from, why they're saying it, what they didn't actually communicate as to the purpose behind the statement. But essentially, the female first hiring policy put him and the talent team in a not ideal position. They're damned either way, and it's a slippery, slippery slope, um, and one that's worth thinking about in the delivery to that individual. And this leads me to my next point around externally addressing the hiring females. With COVID, the great resignation, quiet quitting, a looming global recession, the field of recruitment has never been so uprooted. The pressures are intense. I have talent teams coming to me who's not in a talent role, you know, with their issue, not only is the mandate to hire females, but that the applicant pool isn't large enough. Not enough women are applying for, you know, all the roles. So as leaders and leaders in our industry in this digital economy, we're left with two streams that are essentially our responsibility. The first is to address the current candidate pool, and the second is to ensure that this drought comes to an end. So let's look at the current situation. I would say it's not solely up to talent teams or recruiters to bring the candidates. We need to walk the talk inside our businesses in order to attract the talent. And by that, I mean you, your team, your leaders. If you truly believe diversity is best for business, you need to make that known both internally, as we've just discussed, and externally. Once we've got our teams aligned, we can work from the inside out. We can support communities, um, and under other industry initiatives, you know, like Girls in Tech or other organisations, there's plenty out there, and be part of the conversation and drive the diversity narrative. Don't be afraid to share where your company sits on issues, policies, movements and debates. Don't censor your teams. Encourage them to share, participate, show up and take the time out to attend events like this. And they will share the good bits because that's what people do on social media and in public. They share the things that are great. And think about it. If someone's going to apply for your role, the first thing they're going to do is go on a good old fashioned Google and LinkedIn stalk. And they're not likely going to delve into the LinkedIn profile of your recruiter. They're going to look at yours, your team and your boss. So show them what you want to see. Not a disingenuous propaganda type fashion, you know, I'm into diversity situation, but do your best so that it can seem like it's not forced fun. 
Now, another aspect which combines my first few points is to consider the, the language around how you, you advertise externally for roles. Some recruiters are telling me they're getting zero females applying for certain roles. But there are, and I promise, tech companies out there that are only getting female candidates. And this is where you insert the mind blown emoji. When I heard this, I couldn't believe it. So there is an abundance of talent in lots of cases and attracting them is up to you. Just like Tinder, the next generation are going to want to know if your, if your company is worth swiping right for. And your job advertisements, like dating profiles, need to do that and they need to do that quickly. Now let's get back to the future candidate drought and where we can impact that. As leaders, we see there isn't enough talent to go around, especially with the theme of scale and expansion on the uprise, we need to mitigate this as best we can. Those women that happen to be leaders in their field, experts, or are a very rare find like the best female developers, a few are far between and they're a precious resource. So we want to ensure future generations of women, as many as there are men, pursue the field of STEM. So it's up to us. And where possible, I encourage you and your team to look into your local community, schools, holiday programs and higher education to understand how you and your team can get involved, whether it be mentoring, volunteering, educating or associating with organised groups like ABCN. It's our time to set up for the future, our industries, share our stories and build those pathways. Now, we're almost there, we're almost at my last gripe about that I'm filling my next role with a female. And this is a doozy because it relates to the individual female. So hiring a female for hiring's sake, ticking a box, you know, reaching a quota, doing it just because, or in other words, tokenism is never going to benefit anyone. In order for your team to be set up for success, if you're lucky enough to hire a female candidate, they deserve to be respected, welcomed, known for what they bring to the table career-wise, and not to ever feel like they've been given that role undeservedly by, you know, their peers, their managers, anyone like their customers. Tokenization, although at surface level, might seem to be bringing us one step closer to equality because it skews the numbers, is in fact undoing the entire belief system behind the premise. I, for one, typically don't mention publicly until now that I hold Indigenous descent. From the, from the Warimi people in northern New South Wales, and for a long time, I haven't shared that information. Not because I'm not proud, not because I don't want people to know, but I have this incessant fear that others are going to use this fact to go and tick a box or meet a quota for their own agenda. Because I've had leaders in the past ask me to add that to my employee forms for entirely the wrong reasons and absolutely not. Imagine how that makes an individual feel. No one wants to be hired or promoted because of one aspect of who they are, because they are female, they are gay, they're Indigenous, they're a person of colour. They want to be there for what they do and deliver and because they bring all aspects of themselves. Also, once you have this person in your team, especially if they're the only one, don't treat them as the only female. Like, don't give them that label. Treat them as the first and the first of many. You'd like to think Barack Obama was the first US president of colour, not the only that's ever going to exist. Jacinta Ardern was not elected because she's female, but being female adds to her greatness. So tokenism may seem like it's getting you off the hook, but you're not collecting a set of Pokemon. Hire people for what they can do and who they are and focus on building the foundations for a diverse team to take your organisation into the future. Megan Smith, someone I follow, was pretty spot on in an interview in 2014 where she said, tech companies like to set stretch goals like we'll try to be the best company for women and minorities. And we'll have to ask, what does that really mean? By setting a goal like that, it makes all of us pay attention to the idea, try to innovate around it and understand its underpinnings. One piece is being transparent, saying, hey, we have an issue. 
we're open to innovation around it. And it's important for innovation to prove that more diversity makes better products. For those that don't know Megan Smith, she was a VP at Google that later went on to be the first CTO of the United States of America under Barack Obama. She's an advocate for data, innovation and policy, and today continues to pioneer for equality and inclusivity for women in tech. And to that end, thank you all for listening to me today. Um, I'll pass back over to Raven if there are any questions. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the Wishlist Scale Summit, APAC 2022. Wow. Wow. You're just amazing, Christine. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for I having think me. It, it's honestly just the way that you speak, especially around the likes of your own background, your own cultural background. That's something that resonates with me massively. It's it's taken me years to establish pride is probably the easiest way to say it, you know, especially in the Western world. 15, 20 years ago, that's not diverse, you know, and I think like to think of New Zealand in particular and Australia, actually really across Asia Pacific, I like to think of us as a little bit United Nations, you know, in each of our workplaces, that that level where you can see different accents, we hear different accents, sorry, and see different people. But I think I know you quite well now, I feel, after going to so many of these speeches that you've given and presentations that you've done. And I just want to know around some of those top tips that you have for people that are young, you know, those young women that are coming through into this industry or just tech in general, what are some of those top tips in terms of what to do and what not to do? I think the first thing is when we're talking about like entering into tech is you're just as much in control of your career as the person you're trying to, you know, go for the job with. So really get under the guts of, you know, where you're going to work, who they are, um, you know, what their policies might be and really start talking to people in and around that that company, not just their, you know, employees or maybe their suppliers or other people that you know. And if it doesn't work out, like if you do choose your own company and I've done this, it's okay to say like, you know what, this isn't for me and walk away from it. No one gives younger people, and I feel this is something that I've learned as I've gotten older, is no one gives younger people the permission to say no. You're allowed to so say true. no. You're allowed to hang up, you know, your boots. You're allowed to, you know, walk away from a company that doesn't suit your values. You know, I've been into very interesting um, environments where I've literally had to remove myself and say, look, this team is just not going to be for me. It's like filled with this, you know, type of people. And I just can't look past that. And mm -hmm. it's okay to walk away from that. So I would say, you know, be in control of what you're looking for. Give yourself permission. And don't be too hard on yourself. Like if you're getting started, you know, you can try lots of things. There's no, I think these days you can jump around from, you know, role to role, from company to company. It's really nice to get a very well-rounded background. I interviewed someone a few weeks ago that I've known for about 10 years. And she said, yeah, I am moving around to lots of roles because one day I want to be a CEO. So for her, it's actually beneficial to change, you know, from customer facing to back end to operations, etc. So give yourself permission to try different things. Uh, every role you do now, didn't exist when you went to uni, it didn't exist when you were in kindergarten. So planning for that is is not something that you can, you know, think too far ahead. Um, just remember you're allowed to try lots of things. What for you is your biggest achievement to date, whether that is career wise or whether that's, you know, in your own personal life, because you may not feel this. And I know what you're like, you know, you're, you're the beach going gal who's super relaxed and you're actually a really chilled out human who's just doing her own thing, vibing through life. But, you know, given the nature of what you do for work and that pedestal that you've climbed to essentially, you are inspirational to a lot of us women who are so new and fresh in the game. So it, yeah, it leads me to ask, what is it that is like your greatest aspiration or the best thing that you've ever done? I think achievement wise, it's, it's a bit like a Phoenix situation. It's when you come out of adversity or you're, what you think is adversity for yourself. So for me, about eight years ago, I got divorced and I felt like, the whole sky was falling, you know, financially, where you live. I decided I wanted to change jobs. Like I just, I uprooted my entire life and I got to start from scratch. And one thing I learned from being in a situation where I was kind of just rolling along with life is like, I didn't actually know how to get out there and talk to strangers. I didn't know how to be in a room with people I didn't know. I didn't know how to like enter a, enter a community. So I moved to a suburb where I didn't know anyone. 
I used to go on dating apps so I could talk, learn how to talk to people that I didn't know and pretend that I was interested and learn how to actually interact with people that I had no idea and no intention of ever seeing again. <laughs> so I use all these methods just literally just like try to get back out there. I had to rebuild my entire thought process around where I would like to be financially um, and career wise because all of a sudden it's just you. You don't have to think about another person. You're like on your own. And that was a very big change for my mindset because I've been building towards something for so long. Um, and all of a sudden it's all gone in one, in one fell swoop. So I think for me, it's like coming out of a situation that is is fresh and new and, and making the most of it. Like it's, it's fine to live in a suburb where you don't know anyone because you can just act like a tourist. You know, you can meet randoms, you can have a coffee on your own, you don't have, you can eat in a restaurant by yourself, or you can go and, you know, meet lots of people. So I feel that you've got to really put yourself out there. And I think for me, that was a big achievement because I honestly changed my entire personality and outlook and aspirations. And I do not have, I have a list, I wrote a list of all the goals I had back then and it's still in my iPhone notes. I don't want any of them. Like I literally wow. don't. I really don't want any of them. Some I've achieved and some I'm like, oh. No, thanks. It's like a full Pass. 180, yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's exactly what growth and learning is, right? It's That's mm. personal development at its finest in my eyes. I um, just wanted to ask you one more question, and it was around, you know, yes, at the end of the day, all of us are on our own in life. You know, at the very bottom of the day, the very end of the day, the only person who's really got your back in life and wants the best for you is yourself, maybe your mum probably your mum but you know it's things like that where you you can only but look after your own but then you've also got a community and a network of people that are there to help you succeed you know they want to see you succeed they support people in terms of like your career how does that panned out over the past few years have you found that you find it difficult to trust people or is there like little circles that you know of or yeah how does that work I, I do think your, you know, your career is your, you know, you command that and no one can make decisions for you, but it takes a village. I wouldn't be anywhere where I am without other people. I do trust people. I know, I know the people I trust. I can name the people I trust um, and that I've known for a long time, but I'm always bringing people into the fold. Uh, you need cheerleaders, you need sponsors, you need leaders who will speak on your behalf, you need people that will promote you. Like, don't say no to anyone that wants to have a coffee or a chat or a Zoom call with you. It doesn't matter where in the world they are, whether they're, you know, more senior than you or more junior than you, it makes no difference. It takes a village to get you where you are. No one can do it on their own. I mean, that's one thing that I would definitely say. Um, and people will come and go with different roles in your life. You'll have mentors at one point that won't be mentors in a couple of years. But I do know that if I want to pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm at a juncture. I haven't spoken to you in six years. Let's have a coffee. People would say yes. You know, mm -hmm. people do see a spark in you. And those are the ones that will stick with you. And I do know people that when I started my career in 2006, I think it was, in my first corporate, and I still know some of those leaders and they would still speak for me and, you know, be a reference if I needed to. So don't ever like, you know, throw any cards out of your deck, keep everyone close. And yeah, it takes a village. Just don't think you have to do it on your own. Honestly, I, I have to congratulate you because I feel like what you've done is find the perfect balance of being authentic, raw, truthful and direct, whilst also not burning bridges. And a lot of the time, those two things don't always go hand in hand. So I Thank massively you. commend you on that, Christine. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for coming and speaking to us today. You were absolutely incredible as per usual. And I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day, guys.